just been discussing some extensions of quantum mechanics uh, that try to introduce some fundamental new decoherence sources. Uh, the main motivation apparently is that you want to avoid these embarrassing to some microscopic superposition states. And so, uh, last time we discussed this rather generic Gerardi Rimini Weber uh, example of some fundamental decoherence process where the main idea is that you can arrange parameters such that uh, only the microscopic superposition states get destroyed. They didn't really say where this comes from microscopically, and so it's interesting to learn about other such theories. And the one we started discussing with was uh, first developed by Penrose and Diosi. And the idea is, for some relatively mysterious reason, there is some uh, fundamental decoherence associated with uh, gravity. So it's about gravitationally induced collapse of the wave function. But um, other than that, um, the theory is still formulated within the context of usual quantum mechanics. So we can write down our master equation for the density matrix, for example. Okay, so let me remind you, the idea is if we have some massive particle in a superposition of two places, we want to know the decoherence rate that will depend on these positions or more precisely on the difference of these positions. simple. 
And we see this is really the form that uh, we have also considered before. I can rewrite this by putting out the putting out the free factor gamma infinity, that is this uh, fixed rate to which it saturates, and I can write something like one minus um, eta of x minus x prime. And then eta obviously is a function that is one if the arguments coincide, because then I have to get rate zero, and it goes to zero when I go to large distances, because then I get this maximum decoherence rate. So eta has the same shape, roughly, that we already discussed before, only that instead of just postulating it to be a Gaussian, like Gerardi Rimini Weber did, this really falls off according to a very specific law, one over the distance at large distances, and something more complicated, depending on the shape and so on, uh, at small distances. Okay, so now it's time to plug in some typical numbers. Um, so, which number do I want to discuss first? Let's take a sphere of radius, say, 100 nanometer, and a mass of 10 to the minus 15 gram. And then let's calculate this um, maximum decoherence rate. That is, I'm supposing that I am able to produce a superposition where the distance is larger than these 100 nanometers, which is very challenging, but OK. Um, so I will then find, if I didn't make a mistake in my estimates, uh, 10 to the minus 5 hertz. Of course, this is far too slow to be detected in experiments, because it would mean that you are able to isolate your sphere in this microscopic-like superposition for um, 10 to the 5 seconds, that is for a day, essentially. Um, so, to isolate it against all the other possible coherence processes, and that is unlikely. Now, however, if I take a mass of a gram, and say R of a centimeter, then I get a rate that goes like 10 to the 20 hertz. Note the change in sign in the exponent. <laughs> so then it would be extremely fast. So again, we observe the possibly desirable feature that microscopic superpositions are not very much affected. Uh, even such mesoscopic superpositions are not very much affected, but microscopic objects decohere extremely quickly. And so, uh, why is that? Well, um, if you think about it, suppose that the Okay, so what is gamma infinity? That is g over h bar mass squared over r. That's essentially the self-energy of, of the object itself. Now if you assume the density to be fixed, say the density of water, uh, then the mass will just go like the volume that is r cubed. And so if I insert it here, then gamma infinity goes like r to the fifth power. And so that is even stronger than what we had in the girardi rimini weber ansatz, where it just scaled like the number of particles that would be like the volume, like R to the third. And that's the reason why these rates differ so dramatically. Now, however, things look different still if the distance is small, so small that it is uh, smaller than the extent of the object. So that's this region here which we are now going to discuss. Um, and I'll give you the result of an estimate done by Adler in 2007. And the motivation for doing this estimate was actually a proposed experiment in optomechanics where you would prepare a superposition of a mirror being in this state or being displaced slightly because, for example, it has been hit by a photon. Now, for all realistic experiments, the displacement is extremely tiny. 
So the displacement is much, much smaller than the size of the object. Say, it might be in the femtometer range. And so what did we assume? Well, a displacement of already quite impressive 10 to the minus 13 meter, um, which is already larger than a nucleus. Um, a total size of the object, which is assumed to be a cube, of the order of 10 to the minus 5 meter, which would be 10 micron, which is realistic for a mirror that is able to reflect light, so it has to be a little larger than the wavelength. Um, and a mass of, uh, in this estimate, 5 times 10 to the minus 12 kilogram. So all these are realistic numbers, especially for the objects people study in optomechanics. And then the corresponding rate would be 10 to the minus 9 hertz. And so this is really small, obviously. There's nevertheless some effort to check these things because, well, you never know, possibly there are um, reasons why this weight could be larger and actually in a moment we will come to one such region where, one such reason where the weight can be significantly larger. Before I go there, however, I want to tell you about a slightly different perspective on all of this, which is due to Diosi. Now, if you go back and look at the master equation, you know this looks very conventional, uh, like for the thermal emission of radiation from our molecules. Or I could also produce this kind of decoherence by subjecting my particle to some fluctuating noise field. Some fluctuating potential. It's very easy to, to get such an equation. In particular, I will always get such equations if I assume a fluctuating noise field which is delta correlated in time. So it's white noise in time and possibly somewhat correlated in space in order to reproduce this particular function. And so now Diosi realized that this kind of decoherence would follow automatically if you have fluctuations in the potential acting uh, on your particle, or more precisely, fluctuations in the gravitational potential. And so we can even give a correlator for this. Classical 
electromagnetic field fluctuations, I will get completely wrong results. Now, of course, I can't claim that this is what they do because they don't say what they do, but uh, this is just a warning. So now, let's come back to this weight, which is so tiny that we probably will never have a chance of observing it. It turns out that I can play around with this weight almost at random, and I'll show you how. So the question is, if you give me a sphere of glass, what should be the mass density? So you might say, oh, well, if you tell me the radius and you tell me the density of this material, some, something like this. But then, I could say, well, I want to look at it more closely, and I want to resolve it more closely, and I want to see the individual atoms. If I do this, then I come up with another mass density that has a peak for each of the atoms, and then zero in between. And someone else could even go further and say, no, no, I want to resolve the individual nuclei. That's where the mass is really sitting. And then you would get even more localized spikes. And so this certainly doesn't matter if you calculate the gravitational field outside this object, then you will effectively have average over this mass distribution, over this fine grain structure. But it actually matters really a lot if you calculate the self-energy, the gravitational self-energy of this object. So um, it turns out for this kind of density, the macroscopic smooth density, the decoherence rate goes like g m squared over r. r. m is the total mass of this object, r is the size of this object. And then if I'm interested, for example, in short distances, um, there's an additional factor like this. So that's the relevant expansion for most uh, experiments that you might do, because the distances will not get that much. So this is um, nice. What happens here? Well, I have to specify how large is my atom or my nucleus or whatever is my macroscopic constituent. Let's call this little r. And let's also say that each atom, nucleus, but that doesn't really matter, has a mass little m. And then the result is actually the following. Gamma phi goes like, well, there's a prefactor, which is some of the number of these constituents, capital M over little m. And then g, now little m squared divided by little r, and x minus x prime squared divided by little r squared. And so the problem is that now different parameters appear, and if you really plug in numbers and estimate things for reasonably sized objects of a reasonable density, this can be larger by a factor of 10 to the 12 <laughs> than this estimate. And so, well, on the one hand, it's a good news for the experimentalists who plan to do such experiments, because they can always claim that at least, if nothing else, they will be able to rule out this version of the theory. But on the other hand, of course, it's embarrassing because it seems not to be well defined. So the result depends dramatically on how you resolve your density. And so this is, this is a genuine problem of this theory. This has never been resolved. And um, as an experimentalist, of course, you can take the point of view and you just check whether the 
this is right and right. Okay. Now let me then briefly go back to why you would think that such an ansatz for gravitationally induced de decoherence makes sense. And unfortunately, there is no clear-cut argument for this. I will just try to recount what I read, what Roger Pen Penrose has written. And the main idea is that if you have a superposition of one object in two places, there are two incompatible space-times. And he wants to quantify the degree of incompatibility. Okay, and then he will come up with this measure that I introduced. Now, here then is the idea. In my words, you can try to look it up on your own. So again, we have the superposition, psi 1 referring to my sphere in this position, psi 2 referring to the sphere in that position. He even makes the point that you could even think of this also includes the gravitational field around the sphere. So like in quantum electrodynamics, you would have the charge plus the field around it. So that's not the point in this discussion. Okay, so these are these two places. Now, we assume that each of these quantum states is really a stationary state, maybe to a little approximation. But then we ask, what does it mean to have a stationary state? Well, that's simple. Um, we're just solving uh, the stationary Schrödinger equation with some fixed energy. The problem, though, is that, OK, so what does this time derivative refer to? Um, it's calculated with respect to some given space-time, some given background space-time. That's usually the idea. Or in more formal language, if this produces a time-like translation. And usually that's not, not any problem. But in our particular setting where we want to bring gravity into play, this is the point where Penrose identifies the problem. Because now, if you have a superposition, so psi 1 plus psi 2, these two states in principle correspond to different space times, so because the energy is sitting in different places. So unfortunately, this um, so in standard quantum mechanics, you would say, ah, the superposition of two states with equal energy is also another eigenstate for this energy. It also fulfills the stationary Schrödinger equation. The problem is, since you are working on different space times, somehow there is no way to define this time-like translation for both space times at once. So there is a fundamental incompatibility between these two space times. At least that is what he argues. And so. Um, because that is the case, then he argues also that the energy becomes uncertain because of this. Okay. Now, how to quantify this incompatibility? Well, again, uh, no one knows really because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. But he proposes a measure which at least has the advantage of not being dependent on your choice of coordinates and not um, subject to changes if you just uh, start moving your reference frame. And so that measure of incompatibility that he proposes is the following. So what defines a space-time? The idea is not to go right to the general relativistic formulation, but uh, stay in the Newtonian formulation, because maybe these fields are weak. And then you would say, oh, I just measured the gravitational acceleration at each point in space. And then you could say, these two configurations are different because if I measure the gravitational acceleration, say, at this point in space, it will have a different value depending on whether my object is sitting here or there. 
So somehow you want to take the difference between these accelerations. And therefore the measure he proposes is simply the difference of gravitational acceleration squared and integrated over all of space. So F is really the gravitational acceleration of the gravitational force per unit mass. And so if you, if you tell me the gravitational potential, this would be minus the gradient of the gravitational potential. And so now the idea, from now on, is only algebra, because um, you insert this here, then you apply part integration by parts in order to bring uh, the derivative, the gradient, to the other side. And you will get something like this. So here you now have the Laplacian applied to your difference of potentials. But you know the equation for the gravitational potential, the Laplacian is exactly given by the density. So the Laplacian of phi would be 4 pi g times rho. And so what you get here is just the difference in densities. So you get the difference in densities multiplied by the difference in potentials. And then finally you can insert the integral equation for the potential given the mass density you write the potential at any space-time point as g minus g times integral over the density at all other points divided by the distance. And then if you insert it here, you automatically get practically what we had before up to a constant prefactor, namely a double integral over the difference in densities, because always the difference appears at these two space points divided by the distance. And then of course this does not have the correct dimensions, but you can make an energy out of it if at your proposal you have um, g, so you divide by 1g, and uh, then you can make a rate out. So there is no more to it, so that there is no more mathematics to the theory at the point. Uh, this is all that you can find. Okay. So, I think there's room for further speculation here. Um, this is all I wanted to say about this penrose diosi idea. I want to go back to something which is even more elementary, which is called the Schrödinger-Newton equation. But you will probably agree that it is also a relatively crazy idea. How to 
do that without having a quantum theory of gravity? Well, it's actually fairly simple. The simple-minded approach follows the same line that you would follow when, for example, you write down the Coulomb interaction between electron and proton or between different electrons inside a molecule. You don't automatically go to quantum electrodynamics. You just write down an instantaneous Coulomb potential. In the same manner, you can write down an instantaneous gravitational potential. So you have two masses, M1 and M2, and you simply calculate the gravitational potential between those two masses. And so, then the idea is just, if you have, I don't know, a thousand particles, you simply solve the many-body Schrödinger equation using this potential. And in fact, the results will be perfectly okay. So, 
plus pi times rho pi g, and then the expectation value of my density operator evaluated in whatever quantum many body state I currently have at any given time. And so the idea is then you take the expectation value, you calculate the gravitational potential, and then you reinsert this gravitational potential as a potential into your Schrodinger equation to calculate the further time of this, of course, looks like and also is like a mean field theory. And if you were to apply it to some situation like a very large, massive drop of helium floating in free space, I think it would give a very reasonable results. It would predict that this is stabilized uh, by the gravitational attraction, for example. So that would be nice. But it has one problem it does give you an effect on the center of mass motion that you are under. And more precisely, what this approach amounts to is like taking Hartree theory deal with the gravitational interaction, that you could also treat in the full manner without any problems. Taking Hartree mean field theory and keeping a term which usually is automatically eliminated automatically in, in correct uh, derivations of the Hartree equations, which is self-interaction of a particle with itself. And to illustrate this, we will just go to a single particle where the problem is most severe. So first let me note corresponds to Hartree theory with self-interaction. And if I just take the limit of a single particle, then of course the density on the right-hand side is simply the mass of this particle times the probability density. This is what results from this equation. And of course that is a problem. So if I insert into the Schrödinger equation, I will get the usual kinetic term. Plus I will get a potential derived from the solution of this equation. I can write this down as an integral just as we did before. And so I will then have a term that multiplies my wave function, which is the new effective potential, which is the integral over psi r prime squared dr prime divided by the distance. And then as a prefactor, you would have g and the mass of the particle squared. Right? And just once here, and once when I evaluate the potential energy, which is always mass times gravitational potential phi. So this is the Schrödinger-Newton equation for a single particle. And uh, these things have been considered by a series of orders over the years, including Penrose and Diosi. Um, now this is formally practically identical to, uh, first of all, in general Hartree equations, and also in particular with the gross pityayevsky equation that you would use for uh, describing cold atoms. In that case, you only have a point-like interaction, so instead of having this integral over all other places R prime, you would only have a local interaction, and you would have psi of R squared at this point. But, but from that, it's the same. Only the interpretation is, of course, very different. In the gross pityayevsky case, we know we have millions of particles, and it is a very good approximation to let any one of these particles interact with the mean density of all the other particles. Here I have a single particle which happens to interact with its own probability density. Okay. Now, well, this 
has several unpleasant features. First of all, a lot of the structure of quantum mechanics rests on quantum mechanics being linear. For example, no cloning theory and all of this rests on quantum mechanics being linear. Here this becomes not linear. Um, the second point is it's somehow contradictory um, to have this kind of equation for a single particle, but then for many particles you just take this expectation value of the density operator, which is only a function of the position itself, but the many particle wave function would have been a function of all the coordinates, of the configuration of all the particles. So yeah, it's a little bit weird. But the strangest aspect probably is that this leads to localized solutions. This gravitational self interaction will localize a particle. And so let's have a look. So let's just assume we have one particle in free space and I can draw this wave packet and usually now it would disperse. It would spread ballistically. The width would increase linearly in time at large times. But here the claim is something else happens. And so we treat this wave packet as a kind of variation and ansatz, assume a Gaussian wave packet for simplicity, and treat as the only parameter the size of this wave packet. And the result will be that it is stabilized at a certain size. So the result you might term a soliton-like solution of your Schrodinger-Newton equation. And the idea is the following. Essentially, you apply Heisenberg's uncertainty relation to estimate the kinetic energy. You may have seen similar arguments that give you very quickly the size of the hydrogen atom ground state. You say, oh, the inward Coulomb force is balanced by, so to speak, the kinetic energy pressing outward, and I have to balance these two terms. We will do the same here. So we would say, according to Heisenberg, Delta P is about h bar over delta x, or delta x in this case is really A. And so I can estimate the total energy as being composed of the kinetic energy plus the interaction energy. The interaction energy will be the gravitational self-interaction of this wave function, uh, whereas the kinetic energy is estimated here. So that would be then h bar squared over m a squared for the kinetic energy. You notice that I don't write down any prefactors because that would be beyond the precision of this. And then there is the gravitational interaction, which has a negative sign, it's attractive. And then I will have just G M squared over A. This is a good estimate for what I will get if I integrate my density. And so I want to minimize this. So what I would do is I take the derivative with respect to A. Here I get Two of minus 2 over a cube, and here I get minus 1 over a squared. And so in total, if I then solve for a, what I will get is the following. a goes like h bar squared over g m cube. So you see that 
If the mass is very small, this wave packet will become very large. Only then uh, does this have a sufficient effect. But if the mass is very large, I can get very tightly localized wave packets. And so I plugged in some numbers. Well, let's start with a microscopic mass, say 10 to the minus 25 kilogram. And then what I got is A about 10 to the 17 meters. So that is a huge wave packet. <laughs> so in other words, uh, for such a mass, for such a microscopic mass, this would be completely negligible. You don't need to keep this term in the Schrödinger equation. If you go, however, to something that already contains only a hundred thousand more of these particles, which is still fairly microscopic, then you get an A of about a hundred meter. And then finally, if I take a gram, sort of macroscopic mass, I get an A of 10 to the minus 31 meter. So very, very tightly localized. So that would presumably refer them to the center of mass uh, being tightly localized in this way. Now this is sold as a feature of the theory. Because um, this is another way, instead of decoherence, seemingly to ascertain that your wave packet always stays tightly localized and then moves along a classical trajectory. But it has weird other consequences. And one of them is, for example, you can also have the following solution. You can have one wave packet here, and then another wave packet here. They are both localized according to this calculation. And then they can, they can travel around each other like a little planetary system. So, um, this is one of the weirder aspects of the theory. And you make up your own mind. I still want to discuss a few other of these strange models that people have come up with um, in this context of gravitational decoherence. So this prediction then 
has to do with the mass of the object and some certain parameter, which here is called AC. Now, AC depends both on uh, the object itself as well as on some fundamental constants. It's actually the Compton wavelength to the third power divided by the Planck length to the square. So just, to, just for reference, the Compton wavelength of course is just H star over MC. And the Planck length is the one length you can build out of G, H bar, and C. And that would be G, H bar over the third power of the speed of light. Which is about 10 to the minus 35 meters. So it's indeed a very small length. And so if you plug in these constants and work out what is the decoherence of some reasonably sized object, for example a sphere of a micron being placed in a superposition also of a distance of about a micron, then you get coherence times of milliseconds. So it's not so far from uh, being tested for some So that is one of those models. And again, for experimental checks, this gives you yet another parameter combination to test against. Okay, so just to show you the variety of such approaches, I'll give one last such combination, but then it's enough. So, oh, I won't even write down the orders. Uh, you will find the references on the website. But um, there are people who speculate about how does the structure of space-time, quantum space-time, look like on very small length scales. And they speculate that there are fluctuating wormholes that then interact with particles. It certainly sounds fancy. And at least they can give also a decoherence parameter. Again, in this fashion, gamma over or delta x squared that you would plug into a Gewaldi-Binnigo river, for example. And, well, just for fun, let's write down the combination c to the fourth over h bar to the third, um, m0 to the sixth, and one to the third. Now, m0 is supposed to be the mass of the nucleon, some of the elementary particle that feels um, these wormhole fluctuations. And then of course we know how to, to calculate the decoherence rate for larger objects. And MP is simply the Planck mass.
now it seems to be very difficult to actually change, really change the structure of quantum mechanics without anything breaking down. And there are several speculations that possibly at very small length scales, for some reason, maybe again connected with quantum gravity, um, you have to change your commutation relation between position and momentum. And I cannot judge myself how serious these speculations are, but it's fairly easy to write down the modified commutation relation and to understand at least what would be the prediction and then to quantify this in terms of parameters. So there is possibly quantum gravity, then there are many question marks, and then you get uh, a modified commutation relation. For example, the following. There are several versions, but let us just pick the simplest one. Um, x, comma, p equals, usually this is equal to i h bar. Right? And now you want to multiply with something that modifies this, but only, uh, say, if the momentum becomes very large. Um, so that nothing happens uh, in many other circumstances. So you multiply with one plus some correction term. And the way it's written here is you take the momentum divided by the Planck mass times C and square it. And then, of course, you wouldn't have enough freedom to escape the current experimental observations. So you need at least one other constant. This beta zero is a dimensionless constant that quantifies the size of the deviations. So mp is the Planck mass and beta zero is some constant and you can at least estimate uh, how large or small this should be according to current experimental observations and um, Just so it turns out that it could still be surprisingly large, namely um, in these units, whatever that means, 10 to the 33. Okay, and the goal of experiments would then, of course, be to be able to set to set bounds. Now. Yeah. And this different commutator imply additional term in the Schrodinger equation? Yes, yes, obviously. I don't know whether you would write, try writing down a Schrodinger equation or immediately go to Heisenberg equations of motion, but it's even more obvious. And it would be nonlinear as well, or not? Oh, you mean the Schrodinger equation? Uh, yes. Oh, no. Um, I cannot be completely certain, but I don't know whether this implies a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. I mean, you can just use this as the fundamental computation relation say for writing down your Heisenberg equations of motion and then I don't think you arrive at a non-linear Schrodinger equation. Why would you think so? I don't know. Oh, okay. This is just a line case. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the non-linear Schrodinger equation is really wild because it completely contradicts all the general structure of quantum mechanics. Where it's such a change in the computation relation is in line with usual quantum mechanics. Now anyway, if you accept this, then immediately you can go through the usual derivation of the Heisenberg uncertainty relation and derive a modified uncertainty relation. So that would be delta x times delta p. And now you know that the generalized uncertainty relation is basically that the product of these uncertainties is bounded from below by the expectation value of the commutator. Now usually this commutator was just a constant. I'm going to get just h bar up. But here, um, it's not, no longer a constant. And so what enters here is um, yeah, the momentum operator itself. So let me write it down, the result. It's larger than or equal h bar half times 1 plus beta 0 delta p over Planck minus c. That's the direct consequence of plugging this into the generalist. But it's
discussed this graphing linear action. So what does it mean? If I plot delta x versus delta p, what are the analog values? Okay, so this is delta x and that is delta p. And now usually in quantum mechanics, you would just have to draw this hyperbola that indicates the lower bound for the product. And then everything above this is allowed, but nothing below this line will be allowed. Okay? Now, if I take this modified uncertainty relation, then because of this extra term delta p squared, what I get is the following. This line looks nice at large distances, it just coincides with the old line. Large distances, I can have a small delta p, so this correction term will become small. But then it changes like this. Now that looks somewhat weird, but if you take it serious, what it immediately implies is that since this is the new allowed area, um, obviously you get a minimum length scale. And so this minimum measurable length scale you can then work out pretty easily from just solving this equation and you get it to be the Planck length that we defined before times the square root of this extra constant. And so now um, again you can ask what is the bound that is set by current experiments and it happens to be that this measurable minimum length scale would be on the order of 10 to the minus 19 meter or possibly smaller. And so as a goal for experiments you could set yourself uh, uh, the goal maybe to push down this bound to lower values. Okay, and then there are different modifications which give rise to slightly different modifications of the uncertainty relation and you can try to play around and try to come up with experiments that might see these effects and just recently the Aspelmeyer group has uh, propose an experiment of how you could use an optomechanical setup to measure these uh, modified uncertainty relations. The problem, of course, is that once you start modifying your uncertainty relation, um, somehow you modify all the dynamics, you also modify the whole dynamics of your measurement setup, the whole interpretation of the experiment, and then you have to very carefully assess whether things that you take for granted are still true or whether you have to change it in many different places at the same time. The other question is also whether something like this can be made in a complete, into a completely self-consistent theory. Maybe if you were to follow it very closely, you would then suddenly find that there is some mathematical contradiction somewhere or there is some gigantic uh, effect that it should have which uh, is not observed and then it is ruled out even from present day observations. So all of this could happen. Okay. So probably the, the Schilling theory question that you would get with a higher minimum length, I guess. So I mean higher derivatives. Uh, and that so sounds you, correct. And so if you think uh, that this derivative has the old momenta, it's like speculation at this point. Depends on where you start. Actually, once I start modifying the commutation relation, I would always prefer to write down the Heisenberg equation for motion, but I mm -hmm. definitely know what to do and where to plug in this and how to commutation relation. Oh yeah, how to interpret it is another um, problem. Because you could say, okay, so what 
does this P mean? We possibly this is just a modified momentum and I should just properly redefine things. Okay. Any other questions here, Steve? So is there any intuitive explanation why such corrections would involve P squared or does it make squared? Or who's it? Okay, very good. I was just wondering if there's a deeper meaning. Um, well, I guess if it were to involve x squared directly, this would be fishy because then a special origin would be preferred. Here you could at least argue that, um, well, in a given frame of reference, <laughs> a p equals zero is somewhat special, but x equals zero certainly should not be special. But there are also relativistic extensions of all of this. But I guess everyone has the freedom to come up with his or her own <laughs> modification. Okay, so. Yeah, maybe yeah. It's a similar question for the Newton's Berlin equation. So we know that, let's say, QED, or at least with electromagnetism, such terms do not exist. Is there any reasonable argument why it should be there for gravity? No, I don't think there is a reasonable argument why it should be there. I think this is just. Well, it was introduced first in the context of how should we self-consistently in a mean field way uh, incorporate the gravitational field if we are dealing with quantum objects and I think then it's fine uh, if you don't uh, ask the wrong questions, so to speak. And then later in the 80s, for example, Diosi proposed this as a way of inducing wave function collapse of a gravitational nature. <laughs> and yeah. So it's just some speculation at this point. Uh, there are definite predictions about how this would uh, influence the uh, coherence in, for example, these molecular interferometers. And so in principle, that can be tested. And of course, these predictions uh, completely run counter to what you would get if you don't do this mean field uh, ansatz, but uh, really just insert into the many body Schrödinger equation your gravitational potential terms acting between different atoms, then nothing special would happen. Okay, so on Monday, uh, Steve will give the 